on the ILS, 25 left, slow, I know, 185, heavy light, tower on my 25 left, back line number two, following Tempe, heavy airbrush, three, a mile final. Okay, number two. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and welcome to the second video in the full flight portion of this aircraft's dissected series, where we delve into every single switch, knob and display in the flight deck of the Zebo Mod Boeing 737-800. In the previous episode, we took a look at FlightAware and SimBrief, which are two fantastic flight tracking and virtual flight planning softwares available online, where we planned a real flight from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So in this episode, we're going to be taking all of the theoretical knowledge we have learned in the previous seven episodes, covering every single nook and cranny of the Boeing 737-800 flight deck, and apply it in practice through the initial electrical power-up procedure, as well as the preliminary pre-flight procedure. Hence, though not a prerequisite, it would be extremely advantageous for you guys to watch the first seven episodes in order to get a detailed understanding of each and every system if you're really looking to learn everything about this aircraft. That being said, if you just want to click a few buttons and get yourself in the air, this is the video for you. Additionally, we will also be taking a detailed look at the EFB in the flight deck to be able to configure the aircraft's settings in the simulator properly before starting our flight from cold and dark. This includes setting the right units for weight and balance, configuring nose wheel steering, as well as some visual eye candy. For the actual procedures, I will be using a detailed 737-800 checklist made by Ken Air, which is available online for free. I'll leave a link to this checklist down in the description below, but appropriate elements of the checklist will also be visible on screen while we go from system to system for better visual understanding for you guys. Anyways, that's enough chitter chatter about what we're going to do. Let's jump into the simulator and see how we actually do it. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome to San Francisco at dawn. It's about 5.45 in the simulator at the moment, and we are currently parked at gate Delta 12, as mentioned in the previous episode of the series. As you can see, we're flying with Delta Airlines, and our flight number is going to be Delta 805, and we're going to be starting up this aircraft from a cold and dark state here in San Francisco, and taking it down to Los Angeles along the west coast of the United States. So, without further ado, let's jump into the flight deck. Okay people, welcome to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800, and as you can see, the aircraft is completely cold and dark, meaning that no instruments, panels, or lights are currently running. So, as mentioned previously, before getting into any procedures, we're going to configure some aircraft settings in this EFB over here. As you can see, there are several immersion options for us here to play around with, but we're going to get to that later on during the flight. First, we're going to move our mouse cursor to the right of the EFB, and as you can see, it changes to this right pointing arrow, implying that there is another page we can look at. So click it, and that brings us to page 2 of the EFB, where we have the main settings window here, which says configure and customize. Clicking this option brings us to a whole host of different aircraft parameters and settings we can adjust. Now, I'll only be walking you guys through the actual changes that I have made deliberately, as the rest of the settings are all left to default. I will, however, show each settings page briefly for you guys to pause the video and copy any settings that might not be default in future versions of Zebo Mod. So starting from the top left as usual, we have this Display and Variants tab, which adjusts some external as well as internal features within the aircraft. All of the pages you're seeing right now are left completely default, so no changes there. Let's press this back button down here to go back to the main settings page and let's look at the hardware configuration. Here, this is the only setting I have changed, and I highly recommend you to do so as well, unless you have a proper home cockpit with a dedicated nose wheel tiller. What this setting essentially does is that it maps your nose wheel tiller to a particular axis on your joystick. In my case, it's my rudder pedals. So I'm essentially able to operate the nose wheel of the aircraft while taxiing using my rudder pedals. Next up, we have this Realism tab, where we have these first two options that you can adjust based on your convenience. These essentially change the IRS alignment time and the aircraft fueling time. I normally keep these to short, as I simply start up the aircraft and am ready to go within 20 minutes. However, since we're doing an instructional episode today, I have kept the times to real, meaning that the IRS systems will take about 6-7 to seven minutes to align, and the aircraft itself will take about 15-20 to 20 minutes to get properly fueled up, as is the case in real life. Coming back, 
let's head into the Visual Effects tab, where I have changed this windshield effects setting to Ski Mode, which provides amazing rain effects on the windshield as well as passenger windows, but is also heavy on FPS. So if you have a low to mid tier system, I suggest playing around with either the On or XE settings. Additionally, if you're fishing for a few more FPS, then you can also turn off the windshield and gauges reflection here. I'll leave it on as my system can handle it. Finally, let's go back and head into this general tab, where we're going to take the keep the global units to pounds and the barrel units to inches of mercury, as we're flying in the US today. Everything else is left to default settings. Coming down, we also want to set the engine no run state to cold and dark instead of turnaround. I think it automatically defaults to cold and dark, but if it doesn't, you can always come here and change that setting. Finally, these three settings have been untouched and have been left at default values, so you have nothing to change there. Once we've finished configuring all of these settings, go to the first page of the EFB by moving your cursor to the left side, go into Save and Load Configs, and click on Quick Save All Configs. This basically saves all of the changes we just made in the Settings tab. To get these changes to take effect, simply go up to the menu bar, click on Developer, and click on Reload the Aircraft and Art. Your simulator will then load up the aircraft with all of the changes we just selected. Alright ladies and gentlemen, now that we've configured some changes within this EFB, let's connect some ground equipment to the aircraft and get started with the electrical power up procedure. So what we want to do is to come down to this ground services tab and on the top left, connect the GPU as well as the chocks. The GPU, as you might remember from previous episodes, stands for Ground Power Unit and is responsible for providing power to the aircraft while the aircraft is on the ground and doesn't have the APU or the engines running. As you can see, you see the GPU from the first officer's window and is connected to the aircraft via a wire to constantly provide electrical power while we plan for our flight and we ready our aircraft for startup of the APU. The chocks on the other hand are similar to car wheel stoppers and are rubberized objects that are placed in front of and behind the aircraft's landing gear to prevent it from sliding all over the place when parked at the terminal. So now that we have both of these connected, let's get started with the electrical power up procedure, where we'll be using the Boeing 737-800 procedure checklist supplied by Ken Air, as mentioned before. A link to the procedure checklist may be found in the description, and you may follow along with me as we explore the various panels. So let's get started. Alright, so starting off, if you guys remember from episode 1, the first switch or button to be manipulated by the pilots when starting the aircraft from a cold and dark state is this main battery switch. So let's go over to it and flip this cover down, which will automatically place the encompassed switch to the on position. As you can see, a few lights have come on, indicating low oil pressure, as well as other warnings and we can also hear a few faint sounds of the various subsystems within the aircraft working in the background. The lights are completely normal and are expected during this stage of the power-up procedure. As we work from system to system, these warning lights will all extinguish by the time we're ready for taxi and takeoff. Next up, we're going to come down to this standby power switch and make sure that the switch is guarded by the black cover. Again, as mentioned in episode 1, pilots normally don't ever mess with this system as it's responsible for providing electrical power to all of the critical systems within the aircraft. We just want to make sure that the switch inside is set to the auto position and the guard has been closed. Coming up further to the flight control panel, we have this alternate flaps master switch. Again, make sure that the encompassed switch is not armed by mistake and close the cover. Next up, let's come all the way down to these windscreen wiper switches located next to this APU EGT gauge and make sure that they're both in the park position. The reason for not having the wipers on is twofold. Number one is that it's a beautiful sunny day in San Francisco right now, but more importantly, number two is that the wipers consume a lot of electrical charge and we don't have too much to spare at the moment. This is because we're currently working off of the onboard battery, which only stores electrical charge. It doesn't produce any. So we want to check all critical systems while on battery power without turning anything we don't absolutely need on. Next up, we're going to go to this hydraulic pumps panel and make sure that these electrical hydraulic pumps are set to the off position. This is again to preserve battery power in the early stages of the electrical power up procedure. 
We also want to make sure that the corresponding low oil pressure lights above the electrical hydraulic pumps are illuminated. Coming further down, we have a change of scene from the overhead panel to the forward panels, where we're going to check that the main landing gear lever is in the down position. Additionally, we're also going to check that the three landing gear lights above the lever are illuminated to make sure that the undercarriage of the aircraft is down and locked. And once all of that is done, we're going to head back up to the overhead panel and connect the ground power unit. So we simply head over to this switch right here and you'll see this ground power availability light, implying that a GPU is connected to the aircraft and is ready to supply power. So simply flick this GPU switch to the on position like so. And as you can see, and probably here, some external cooling fans have now come on and some of the warning lights on the overhead panel have also extinguished. We now have constant electrical power from the GPU and we'll use it to be able to plan for our flight before starting the APU just prior to engine start. Speaking of the APU, although we're not starting it yet, we still need to conduct a few fire related tests before starting it. And since it's part of the electrical power up procedure, let's conduct those tests now so we don't have to worry about it when we eventually get around to starting the APU. So first up, we're going to come to this engine and APU fire panel and verify that these three big buttons are pushed in. Next up, we're going to make sure that the overheat detection switches on both sides are set to the normal position, instead of fire detection loop A or B. This switch isn't simulated in the Zeebo anyway, but real pilots would check it at this time. Coming underneath, we're going to flick this test button to the left and verify that the overheat detection and APU detection in operative indications are working as intended. Next up, we'll flick the same switch to the right and observe if the three main fire extinguishing switches come on, accompanied by an audible alarm. While keeping that button held, we're going to go to this master fire warning switch and push it in. As you can see, that stops the red lights and also silences the alarm. Finally, we then move to this switch on the right side and flick it both ways to see if the extinguisher indications are working as intended. Once all of this is done, we are now clear to start the APU as we please, obeying all of the noise abatement procedures at the airport of course. Alright ladies and gentlemen, with that we've finished the electrical power up procedure for the aircraft. Just a little recap of what we've done. We've established constant electrical power to the aircraft using the GPU and have tested multiple fire detection units within the aircraft to make it safe for us to start the APU with ease when we eventually need to. So next up, the final procedure list for this episode is going to be the preliminary pre-flight procedure, which can be performed by either the captain or the first officer. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first item on the list is the IRS mode selectors. So let's go to the aft overhead panel and locate them. Here they are. So we want to make sure that they're first in the off position and then turn them to the nav position. You want to do this one by one for both the IRS mode selectors. So flick one of them to nav. You'll see the on DC light come on, signifying that the IRS systems are drawing direct current, but that light will soon extinguish and will be replaced by this white align light on the left. Once that's done, you move the second IRS mode selector to the nav position as well. So just as a side note, since we set the IRS align time to real earlier on during the video, they will take about 7 minutes to align. To see the exact progress of their alignment, simply go up to this IRS display selector knob and switch the back knob to the heading slash status mode. So as you can see, it's going to take about 6 to 7 minutes for both the IRS units to align. Alright, once that's done, the next item on the list is to turn the voice recorder switch on. Again, this panel is not simulated in the Zeebo Mod 737, so nothing really you can do there. Coming back to the aft overhead panel, we make sure that the PSEU or proximity switch electronic unit light is extinguished, as well as the GPS light on the IRS panel is also extinguished. If either of these lights were illuminated by any chance, we'd have to call maintenance to fix the problems as they're both critical systems. Moving right, we ensure that the service interphone system is set to the off position, and the engine panel is also set. What this means is that the EEC or engine electronic control switches underneath the covers are set to the on mode instead of the alternate mode, and that the engine reversers and the engine control lights are both extinguished. 
Coming further below, we need to ensure that the oxygen panel is set, meaning that the crew oxygen supply pressure is between 1000 to 1500 PSI and that the passenger oxygen mask cover is guarded. Additionally, also ensure that the passenger oxygen on light isn't illuminated, as that would signify that the oxygen masks for the passengers in the back have been deployed. While we're here, also make sure that the secondary landing gear light on the aft overhead panel shows all green, thereby again signifying that the wheels of the aircraft are in the downed and locked position. Finally, we want to come to the right here and make sure that the flight recorder switch is guarded and that the off light next to it is indeed illuminated. Finally, the last item on this procedure demands us to come back down to this throttle quadrant and verify that the parking brake is set. So make sure that the lever itself is in its pulled back position and the big red cherry light next to it is illuminated. And that's the end of the preliminary pre-flight procedure. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering the electrical power-up as well as the preliminary pre-flight procedures. If you've made it this far into this rather short video to be honest, congratulations! You now have a sound understanding of how to start up a Boeing 737-800 from a cold and dark state and provide it with an electrical power source to be able to plan for a flight on the ground. Additionally, you'll also know how to get the IRS systems ready for alignment and to take various precautionary measures to start the APU within the aircraft. That being said, the next episode in this series will focus on programming the FMC, or Flight Management Computer, within the Control Display Unit. In stark contrast to this episode, the next one is going to be relatively long, as there are several things to explain, such as navigation, performance, and other such important flight-related features. However, the rest of the videos in the series will be coming out much faster than they have been up till this point, as I only need to record one flight and the various aspects of it that need explaining. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comments section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.